All right. We are done with exam one. I hope you guys did good. You felt okay during the exam. Yeah, most people had a sense of confidence in their eyes while, while taking the exam, so I felt good too. I couldn't see online people, but you guys showed me, whoever was here showed me good signs. Okay, so we are trying to get that graded. Hopefully by Thursday of this week, you guys will know your score. Um, in the meanwhile, we'll continue our discussion on MIPS ISA. These are uh, sort of the last main topic. Uh, pipelining is the last main topic with uh, MIPS ISA, because after this, we will jump into memory. And the conversation about memory is going to help us transition into operating systems. So when we come back after the summer break, that's what we'll be doing. We'll be transitioning over to operating systems. Okay, so pipelining. So the, the whole idea about pipelining is there's a fire, we are trying to put out the fire, right? And when you're trying to put out the fire, one option is one guy goes back and forth with a bucket of water, tries to put it, put it out. Not helpful. What can you do? To make things faster, you can have a human chain, right? Where you're passing buckets of water. Just pass it to the next guy, but just pass it to the next guy. So that way, things are gonna happen much faster than the first option, because now each person in the human chain is constantly moving buckets of water. There's no time they, they are wasting, right? Because they are, they are constantly getting a next one to pass on. So that way you are going to get a lot of speed up. Now, the same way we are gonna apply pipelining to our computer architecture to make things fast. We have a few hardware resources that are available. ALU, uh, your register file, memory, data memory, instruction memory, right? So all these uh, hardware resources, instead of one instruction using them completely, and then second instruction coming in, and third instruction coming in, what you can do is, first instruction gets in, it uses the first stage, goes to the second stage, second instruction comes in right away. Right? So that way you can have multiple instructions in the pipeline work using different uh, hardware resources. There are some problems uh, because of that, uh, but those have solutions as well. So the, let's talk about the problems uh, we will encounter as we are doing this pipelining, and we'll also talk about what are the solutions to that. So, like I said, the, 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 the example about a uh, human chain to put out a fire, so we have a similar example over here, uh, giving us some specific numbers. So there are four people who are trying to do their laundry, and they chose the same day to do it. Alice, Bob, Kathy, and Don. They have to use a washer, dryer, folder, and a stasher. Each activity takes about 30 minutes, right? So 30 minutes for Alice, using the washer, and so on. So they have to use these four re resources. So in terms of resources, there are four of them. In the time to use each resource is 30 minutes, right? So that's our problem. How are we going to do, do this? We are trying to do this on the same day, right? So the first option, a bad option, obviously, is sequential laundry. So I'll do it first, then you do it, then you do it, then you do it. So if we do it that way, so you see what, what, what uh, the, the way we are drawing this uh, timing diagram essentially is on the top axis over here, you have time. So Alice started doing laundry at 6 p.m. So all the way up to 2 a.m. That's your time scale. And then there is a task order on the y-axis. So A goes first, B goes next, C goes next, D goes last. So what do we have here? 30 minutes each for four four resources, four resources, four resources. So it's going to take about eight hours for four people to do their laundry. Begs the question, can we do better? Yes, of course we can do better. A got done with using the laundry machine at 6.30. That laundry machine wasn't used until 
two hours later, right? One and a half hour later. We could have started using it for B. So that's what we are going to do in the pipelined option. So pipeline laundry looks something like this. Here, same four resources. The amount of time taken to do each task is the same, still 30 minutes. The task order is the same. We are starting at the same time, but we are ending much earlier, right? In the previous diagram, we took eight hours to finish this. Now we are taking only three and a half hours to finish the same four loads. So this accounts for better than twice as fast. Now what is going to change in our, in our example? Instead of having a laundry folder, stasher, uh, a dryer, we are going to have ALU, memory, data memory, uh, register file, hardware resources. Uh, and instead of A, B, C, D, what are we going to have? Different instructions going through, load word, add, add I, and so on, right? So different instructions on the y-axis, different hardware resources uh, in terms of resources. Questions about so, so the, the connection between pipelining for computer architecture and the example that we're talking about. Everybody says this is so simple. So let's go into a little, a little bit deeper. So pipelining is not reducing the time for each task. 30 minutes for laundry and for all the other things remain 30 minutes. So single task time didn't change. What does that translate to in our computer architecture conversation? If you have a data access for two nanoseconds, we are talking about each, uh, each task taking some time, right? Delay analysis, what, what we did for different instructions, load word, branch, and so on. If you want to uh, say, use an ALU, it is going to take you two nanoseconds. That's what we assume. So we are not changing the time it takes to do a particular operation per hardware resource, we are trying to optimize the overall time. So what it, what it raises is the throughput of the entire workload. Throughput means, means what? Number of jobs in a given amount of time. That's what we are trying to incre uh, increase. So what we are really trying to do is we are trying to increase the number of instructions that we can execute in a given amount of time. Multiple tasks operating simultaneously, that are going to be using different resources, right? One uses instruction memory, the other guy is using register file, the other guy is using ALU and so on. There are some problems. And if you are trying to think ahead, you already know those problems, right? For example, if a new instruction is put into the pipeline, what is going to happen to some of the details about the previous instruction? Where are they going to be? Are they going to be overwritten? Are they going to be lost? So that's a problem that we are going to face later on, and obviously we can solve that using uh, some other hardware. Now, let's talk about the next thing here, ideal speed up. Ideal speed up is essentially the ratio of the time it takes for you to do it in the pipelined, uh, sorry, non-pipelined uh, option divided by the time it takes for you to do the same job in the pipelined option. So, and I'll show you that it is uh, also equal to the number of stages. So in our previous example, we had four stages, right? Laundry, uh, what is that, dryer, folder, stasher. So four things. So our ideal speed up should have been four, but we, we did not calculate it to be two, uh, four. What did we calculate it to be? Uh, let's talk it about over here. Speed up. non-pipelined divided by pipeline. Earlier we said eight, next we said 3.5, right? So just over two then, right? Not four, just over two. We wanted four, so where is that coming from? Well, you will have to think about this forever. A, B, C, D, E, F goes on forever. Everybody is using the four resources. Then you will tend to four. That's what happens in our computer architecture, right? Instructions keep coming in. It's not gonna be like four instructions and then stop. Let's calculate the speed up. 
instructions will keep coming in. So we have to calculate it. We have to sort of determine this value as time goes to infinity, right? Like uh, as you are executing more and more instructions. So right now it's just two, but that is because we have only considered a small number of uh, tasks. But I, I will show you that it actually uh, equals the number of stages uh, in, a, in, in just a bit. Now, what are we going to lose? We are going to lose some time to fill the pipeline and to drain the pipeline. For example, if the first guy is using the um, washer, the second guy can't use the washer right away, right at the beginning. And also, if the second resource, the second hardware resource, which was our dryer, it is second, right? So B can't use it before A has used it. So there is going to be some time that you spend to fill the pipeline and to drain the pipeline. So that's going to sort of reduce our speed up. What is also going to reduce our speed up is unbalanced lens. Also, the, the, the time it takes for you to complete each task. So for example, if you had washer takes 30 minutes, dryer takes one hour, right away you see that un, uh, imbalance, unbalanced, and that will spoil your speed up. Uh, in order to, for you to have a good speed up value, have all of them uh, at the same value so that there is synchronous nature that's met. This guy gets done, other guy can come in right away. There's no bottleneck created. The overall rate is going to be limited by the slowest stage. So that's very obvious, right? If, if the dryer is taking you a long, long time, that is going to play the spoil sport. That is going to reduce your speed up. Now, let's take the same laundry example and let's take, uh, let's do some analysis of how we get that four value, right? How we get that ideal speed up to be four. So what I did over here is I've written up a simple MATLAB code to just do that same calculation. So on the X axis over here, I have the number of loads. Earlier we had four loads, right? A, B, C, D. Now, just to see how it goes to four, I have increased that to all the way to 500. So that's number of loads, number of people trying to do laundry. On the y-axis, I have total time in hours. So obviously, if more and more people are trying to do the laundry, the time taken is going to keep on increasing. However, it increases differently depending on whether you do a pipeline or non-pipeline way. So if you do it sequentially, right, one after the other, which we, which we are calling the non-pipeline laundry, then it's going to be this way, right? Every two hours, somebody gets done every two hours. Now, if you do it using the pipeline option, which is right after the first 30 minutes, B can start using it, and C can start using it, and so on, then you're going this way. The gain was three and a half hours, and then you can keep. Now, what is the, uh, every load is getting done in 30 minutes. So every load is getting done in 30 minutes. In the non-pipeline option, every load was getting done in two hours, which is also another way to calculate speed up. Speed up equals time in which you are completing a non-pipeline instruction, a uh, non-pipeline uh, task, divided by time for every pipeline instruction to complete. So it would be two hours divided by half hour, uh, which would also give you the same uh, four, right? So let's go back to this. So I have this non-pipeline over there. I have pipeline over here. Speed up is non-pipeline time divided by pipeline time. You divide this, you get the red line. Now with the red line, you use the y-axis all the way to the right, which is for speed up. You can see that the speed up shoots up from one, two, three, and then it will asymptotically reach to four, right? So you, to, to, for you to actually see that ideal speed up tending towards the number of stages, you have to consider a lot of loads, right? And for us, it will be a lot of instructions coming in, not just a few, but you have to think about it as a continue, continuing process. Uh, if you want to play around with this example, 
a little bit more, and at your time, I have attached a MATLAB code. I don't know how many of you are familiar with MATLAB, but essentially, I have the 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 code 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 is here, and all the other things are with respect to plotting this. So it's because I wanted it to look nice. So the, the, the equations are here, that's it. All right, uh, let's see. Now let's talk about, forget about the laundry, forget about the human chain putting out fire, let's get into the instructions. Pipelining computer instructions. We have a few things to consider here. First, the steps taken and how much time uh, is associated with each step. So for the life cycle of each instruction, what do you have? Instruction fetch, you will have to do a register read, you will have to use the ALU, you will have to access the data memory, and maybe you will have to write the result of the instruction back into the register file, which is also a register access. So you have got two nanoseconds, one, two, two nanoseconds, as assumed times to use those hardware resources. Next, we are considering three load word instructions over here. What is this? Uh, load a word from where to where. Go look at the base address in register zero. That is going to be all zeros. Add 100 to it. So that's going to be address of 100. Load whatever you have over there into register one. Load whatever you have in uh, uh, address 200 into register two. Load whatever you have in address 300 into register three, right? So you're doing three load word instructions one after the other. So let's take a look at the bad way here first. What is the bad way? One after the other. So if you're trying to do the first one here, you see, what do you have? Program execution order going down and you have time in nanoseconds as the X axis. We know that for a load word instruction, you need to do all these five steps. Instruction fetch, what are you doing over there? You are reading the instruction memory. Register access, what are you doing? You are doing a read operation for the register file. ALU, well, ALU is ALU. You are using that to add, right? Add what to what? Base address to the 32-bit sign extended offset. Next, data access, what are you doing over there? This is a load word instruction, so you're, of course, reading the data memory over there. And then you also have to do a register write, because you load word from memory to the register, so you have to write there. If you do all these five steps for the load word instruction, you're going to need eight nanoseconds to do this. Now, that eight nanoseconds staggered for three load word instructions, one after the other, is going to give you what? 24 nanoseconds. Quick question, based on the things we have discussed so far, how uh, small can we make this? This is showing 24 nanoseconds, right? Uh, so let me ask you, speed up. What should we speed up? Ideal speed up should be tending towards what number? So, Washer, dryer, folder, stasher, four things. Uh, so it's, it's not depending on the number of instructions. Number of instructions is like four people doing laundry, 10 people doing laundry. So that's going to continue forever. So it's supposed to be five, right? So we are going to get, five, because we have five things here, right away when you look at it, you say, okay, ideal speed up should be five. So if it is five, then you should be able to calculate the time it takes for you to do this in the pipeline architecture, because five equals 24 divided by X, right? Well, it may or may not work out. There is a problem with that. What is the problem? If you look closely over here, less amount of time, more amount of time. There is an unbalance in the lengths. That's going to create a problem, which is going to hurt our speed up. We'll talk about more about that next. 
So let's try to do this using the pipeline architecture, pipeline execution. So on the top, we still look at the non-pipeline time for three instructions going through these five stages, giving you a total of 24 nanoseconds. Next, on the bottom over here, we have the pipeline architecture, pipeline option. You see, instruction fetch takes two nanoseconds for the first guy. Soon after it gets done, load word, the second instruction is using the instruction memory. It is reading the instruction memory. Soon after that is done, the third load word instruction uses that. That's going to be okay. However, for the second instruction, we are not using one nanosecond. We are actually using two nanoseconds. We are trying to break up a register read and a register write operation in, uh, we are trying to differentiate that between the first half cycle and the second half cycle. So if you have a register access indicated here as the right half, then this is essentially reading, reading register file. And at the end over there, what we have is the first cycle, first one nanosecond, that is writing register file. Good. The register write. So uh, talk to me about address. The address is also the problem, right? Because, okay, you're writing and reading. What address? So address is also an additional. Yeah, so you, you can have a different read address. And, uh, well, there is one hard hardware resource. So you're not going to be able to do two memory accesses during the same clock cycle. So you can read in one clock cycle and then you can write to it in another clock cycle. Because in one clock cycle, you cannot do two things to the same memory. Does that make sense? It's a clock cycle that is limiting it. Uh, so register, well, forget about whether you can do it or not. Also, you cannot do it. Right? In load word case, you don't even have the thing to write yet. You're going to get the thing to write over here. Whatever you write to memory, that is going to be ready over here, right? So you go through, you add what? You add zero, whatever you have over here, which is zero, to 100 over there. Then you perform a memory read operation. Then you get the thing that you need to write to register one, that you can write at the end. So you, even if you could write at the beginning, you wouldn't be able to because you don't have the thing to write. Does that make sense? Okay. So you, you cannot write, plus you wouldn't be able to because you don't have the thing to write. Um, let's see. There are actually some other problems with that as well. Uh, We'll, we'll talk about that. I cannot be using the same hardware resource for two instructions simultaneously, which is, a, which is a type of hazard that we are going to look at, which is also to the same point. All right, so we have got the instruction fed two nanoseconds, register access when you are reading it is moved to the second half, so the two nanoseconds again over there, and then register access for the third time why there is a space between instruction fetch and register read. Okay, so instruction fetch, ALU, and data access. These are two nanoseconds each. Register access is one nanosecond. It is, the, it is a fast hardware resource. However, in order for you to pipeline things, 
you are going to have to give up on that one nanosecond anyway, right? So think about doing laundry with, with say half hour washing and then drying for an hour. Because of that fast and slow, there's no point, even if you did multiple laundries, where are you gonna dry? You're gonna have to wait anyway. You guys see that? So now to differentiate between a read type of access and a write type of access for a register file, we are saying, let us assume that the uh, read happens in the second half of the clock cycle and the write happens in the first half of the clock cycle. So that's the reason why there is a blank in the first uh, space there. Go ahead. Absolutely right, yeah. So even if you remove that, you push the register up, gets done in one nanosecond, one nanosecond, what is it going to do after that? Right, so, because there is an instruction before that which is using the ALU, right? You have to think about it as a continuation process. So, th that's the reason why you'll have to give a space. Now, just to differentiate between read and write, we are saying let's give a space over here and let's give a space over here for write. We'll follow the same thing for the second load word instruction and the third load word instruction. Now, what is the total time? Started at one nanosecond here, ended at 13. Uh, so 13 nanoseconds is your uh, total time taken in the pipelined architecture. Earlier it was 24. So just close to two is your speed up. Speed up is time taken to do it in the non-pipelined way divided by time taken to do it in the pipeline way. So for our short example here, we had a speed up of 1.8. However, our number of stages were five. Right, so if, the, if, if pipelining is running at full blast, an instruction completes every two nanoseconds, right? So if this is going this and this and this F and continues, right? Every instruction is completing what? Nine over there, 11 over there, two nanoseconds. 11 over here, 13 over there, two nanoseconds. Two, every two nanoseconds, an instruction is finishing over there. Over here, it is every eight nanoseconds, right? So every eight nanoseconds, an instruction finishes in the non-pipelined way. And over here, every instruction gets done in every two nanoseconds. So when you do the division, eight divided by two, you got four, which is still not five, right? So we get a speed up, average long-term speed up of four, but it is still not five, which, which was expected, right? At the beginning we said, we, we have four, five resources, so it should be, number of stages are five, so it should be five. It's not. And the problem is what? Now it is the unbalance of the lens. Because this guy is eight, but it could, it, it really is what? It is really 10, right? Why is it 10? Because it starts here, four, six, eight, 10. We have just assumed that it is uh, one and one, but if you use the complete cycle, it is actually 10, right? So 10 divided by, uh, what is that? 10 divided by two, that would give us five. So that's where our expectation is failing us, right? That unbalance is making us, making us go down from a speed up of five to a four, really. Questions here? So we are unable to reach five here because of uh, the unbalance between that two nanosecond and one nanosecond. Okay, so let's talk more about these things. In the pipeline architecture, pipeline execution, one instruction takes eight nanoseconds. First load word, second load word, third load word, and so on. It's taking eight nanoseconds. In the pipelined way, you're wasting one nanosecond to make all stages synchronous. So we are wasting one nanosecond over there and we are making one nanosecond over there, which is, which is what 
uh, makes this pipeline instruction really 10 nanoseconds. That's the reason why we were uh, getting that speed up number of uh, five instead of four. Now let's talk about the pipelining characteristics. What is the performance benefit? Well, while the time to execute each instruction is the same, in fact, even more, the average execution time has decreased. The average execution time has decreased. That's our uh, advantage over here. Um, ideally, only one instruction finishes every clock rate, uh, clock cycle, and we tied this back into what? We looked at a few different uh, type of instructions, there was one instruction that was the longest, which I believe was what? The load word instruction. You had to go through the load word instruction and it took about eight nanoseconds to finish that. Eight nanoseconds, that's what limited our clock cycle time. This is transparent to the users. For the users, they don't see what is happening in the background, right? So whether you're doing it in the non-pipeline way or the pipeline way, it's just the execution time that they're going to see. They're not gonna see the effects of the hardware. And what this really is, is that we are using parallelism to use almost all the hardware resources almost all the time. Nobody should be uh, sort of uh, not doing things. Everybody is working almost all the time. But it is for different instructions. Now let's talk about the MIPS pipelining characteristic. How it, does it apply to our MIPS ISA? For MIPS ISA, it was designed with pipelining in mind, which is why your instructions are all of fixed length, 32 bit. There are a few formats, R, I, and J. So there is a lot of uh, regularity built in to the MIPS ISA for that purpose. Uh, memory operands only appear in the load and store word uh, instructions operations, operands are aligned in memory. Word aligned operands, uh, you've got memory uh, access of uh, instructions as load word and store word, all instructions are 32 bit. Some of the challenges. So this is where it gets interesting, where now you start seeing what are the challenges that you could have, because now you're trying to do things fast, you will end up in some very tricky situations. So challenge number one, sometimes the next instruction cannot execute in the next clock cycle. Why is that? Here we have two instructions. We have an add instruction, and then we have a subtract instruction. Add instruction, what are we changing? We are changing S0, right? We are adding T0 and T1, and we are writing to S0. And immediately in the next clock cycle, we are using S0 as an operand. This is what we call a write use. Write over here, and immediately use over here. Right? In the first one, S0 is a destination. We are trying to write to it. And in this next instruction, we are right away using it as an operand. Now, because add and subtract, the first is add, then is subtract, right? So you would really expect that this S0 has the value that you wrote over here, the new value. But if you do this in the pipeline way, does it really use the uh, new value or the, is it the old value? Let's take a look. So the first, uh, instruction over here is for add, and this guy is subtract, right? Now, when are you doing the adding? You do the instruction fetch, read the instruction. It's an add instruction. After that, you need to read the register file. You have to do the addition. Do you do the data access? Over here, you don't do any data access, right? You bypass the data memory over here. You, there's an add instruction, nothing to do with memory. But you will have to write it. So when do you write it? You write it over here. Write S0 here. Uh, so I, that is two, two, two. 
after six nanoseconds. However, for the next instruction that has already come into the pipeline two, sec two nanoseconds later, we did an instruction fetch, it's a subtract, we need to know what the register is, right? Register read over here, we are reading it over here. Dollar S0 is red here. Because it's an operand in this case. So clearly, we are not ready with the new data here. So what is it going to do? Is It is going to simply take the old value of S0 and go through the instruction, which was not intended, right? If we really intended that, we would have put a sub subtract above add. We would have made the subtract operation go, go first. You, you see what the challenge is? Yeah? Now, I, I'll ask you guys this. Um, if the situation was reversed, if this guy was above add, would you have a hazard? This is a hazard. This is a data hazard. Would you have a hazard if this guy was above here? Okay. Why are you so sure? Go ahead. Uh, so, so forget about the program needing the the value. If you if you put this guy up here, it looks like this, right? Subtract dollar t zero to t two dollar s zero dollar t three, right? And this guy is not here. Scratch this off. You have these these two. Is there a data hazard present or not? It's not present. Why is that? So try to observe why is this color coded? So for a data hazard or a hazard to happen over here, we should be doing a right use, writing it and immediately using it. That's the problem, right? So the register that we write to and the register that we use should be the same. If they are not, we don't have a problem. So in this case, we were writing to a T2, but we are never using T2 here. So we are fine. You see that? Okay, let me erase this part here. So all you are checking for is, is the destination register in one the same as one of the operands in the next one? It could be RS or it could be RT, right? It could be one of them. So start thinking about the logic that you would need to implement in this hazard unit, hazard detection unit if this guy is the same as this guy or this guy, right? Now you are able to write logical statements. We are gonna later implement it in a hazard unit, detection unit. Questions here? Good. Yeah? Absolutely. So they are. Uh, you, so now you are looking at solutions, right? So when you start looking at solutions, there are some good solutions, there are some bad solutions. The bad solutions involve things like, uh, let us do nothing until the new value is ready, right? Those are called. That's a st stalling stalling option. Uh, stalling is implemented using NOPs, NOPs, no operation. That's an instruction by itself. So by executing NOPs, you can stall the pipeline, wait until the value is ready, and then you can use it, right? So what you're trying to do is really, you see, you wish that this guy was moved here, right? So this guy was not here. It was not here even. 
it was here. So if it was here, written and then read, it would have been okay, right? So in terms of staggering that later in time, you would have wanted this to be here, not, not, not just here, but here, right? So you need to push it one down, two down, two times later, right? That would mean two knobs. If you, if you have two no operation instructions between the add and the subtract, you would have been done. That would, that would be a, a, fa a way to fix it. There is another way of fixing it, which is register forwarding. Register forwarding is essentially, I will put buffers in the middle of every stage so that whatever I need, whatever information I need to execute this particular instruction, I will keep that instruction until the instruction finishes. I will keep that information along with it. I will not overwrite it. Uh, and so to support this, what we do is register forwarding. Now, if I tell you what register forwarding is, it is going to take away the thunder from the next lecture. So I, just, I don't want to give that away. Uh, because that's very, that's the, one of the interesting things that we do here. So let, let's keep that. But stalling is one way. Rearranging the code is another way. Advanced compilers can do it. Some basic compilers can do it. But that's another way, right? So rearrange code, stall, register forwarding. These are your uh, three options. Does that answer your question? Okay. Next. Next challenge. So the, the one before this was what? Write use. Write use hazard. Write use. Next is sometimes the next instruction cannot execute in the next clock cycle because of, say, a branch instruction. So consider these two instructions here, branch when equal, and the next instruction is add. And you're trying to do this using a pipelined way. So when do you evaluate the branch? Because when you're doing this evaluation of branch, there's a condition, right? You're checking the value of this register equals that register or not. In this case, does the value of register one equal re value of register two or not? If it does equal, then you execute something at PC plus four plus four times 40. Yeah? But if it is not equal, then you execute add. However, by the time you evaluate, add has already come into the pipeline. You have started executing add already. So what do you do now? You, you, you couldn't have, right? Where do you evaluate the branch when equal? You remember, you go through the ALU, you subtract the value of one register from the other register, only after this ALU, the zero result of this ALU, that's when you know whether you are executing the next instruction or the branch instruction, right? That's after this. But you have already brought in the add instruction, which is next, into the pipeline already. You have started working on it. So what is the fix here? So that's the problem. You, you, you couldn't have done that. You don't know which to bring. You, you know, if this is your, say, PC, your two, two options. One was PC plus four, and the other was PC plus four plus four times 40. You had to pick one based on the branching, based on the contents of these two guys. But it looks like you already picked this and you started working on it. That's the problem. What is the solution? Was that saying forgiveness and permission? It is better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. Yeah. That's what we do here. you start working on the next instruction. If the branch instruction evaluates differently, then we will drain the pipeline and then do the next one, right? It is better to start working on something than do nothing, yeah? So you start working on something 
and then if needed, you can trace things back. But a better option than that would be, let us try to use the statistics of the operation. Let us say that 90% of the time, branch is not taken. 10% of the time, branch is taken. That is what usually happens to you when you write, say, like a for loop, right? When you write a for loop, 90% of the time, you are in that loop. Only one time, one time you, you go out of the loop, right? You, almost all the other time you are inside the loop. So branching conditions have statistics involved with them. So you, let's use that statistic to help our decision making over here. So based on that, we can say, all right, let's stick to executing the next instruction. If the branch statement stays otherwise, we'll backtrack, we'll drain the pipeline and then we will execute the instruction at PC plus four plus four times 40. So I hope that you like the challenge here and you also like, you're intrigued by the solution as well. Questions? And this is called a control hazard. Control signifying that this was a condition. Earlier, that was a data hazard. Right use, data hazard. So there are three types of hazards. Data hazard, like we saw over here. Second one is a control hazard, that is for the branching instruction. The third type of hazard is a structure hazard, where we are trying to use the same hardware re resource for two different instructions at the same time. Questions, data hazard, structure, uh, control hazard. What is the problem? And some ideas about how to fix it. We have not looked at the details, but just some ideas about how to fix it. Okay, we talked about control hazard here. Next, we look at the structure hazard. So structural hazard is using the same hardware resource simultaneously for two different instructions and at the same time. So what we have here is, a load word instruction followed by any three instructions, any, any of them. So when you do this load word instruction, you have instruction fetch, register, access, ALU, data access, register access way at the end for writing. And then you have any three instructions over here. Now, if you look at the data access step and the instruction fetch step, they are going to be right at the same time and they are going to be the same hardware resource. This is memory. This is memory. We are reading or writing over here. We are reading over here. We are accessing the same memory for two different instructions at the same time if we do that. You guys see that? That should not happen, right? So that is going to lead to a hazard situation. The, the solution to this uh, is just uh, stalling. So e either you stall or you rearrange the code, uh, but rearranging the code will also not help you because this is any three instructions, right? So stalling uh, might be the only way to fix this problem. Load word followed by any three instructions. That's a structural hazard because we are trying to access the memory, the same memory that we have in the same time for two different instructions. So those are your three hazards classified as your three challenges. And we talked about some of the solutions. Now our goal today and so today will be more about learning the problem. Next lecture will be about solving it, right? So let's see how we can use register forwarding or stalling uh, techniques to solve that problem. Today we'll focus on understanding the challenges a little bit more. So this is your summary of your pipeline hazards, three of them, data control and structure. Data is attempt to use an item before it is ready. So I uh, call it a sort of a write use had write use. As a, the destination register in one instruction is the same as the 
one of the operands of the immediately next instruction, right? Then use, immediately use. So that's your data hazard. The problem, the new value is not ready yet. Consequence, old value, old value will be used in the calculation. Solution could be stall, rearrange code, or register forwarding. Control hazard, attempt to make a decision before the condition is evaluated, like the BEQ, right? Before you even know the next instruction to be executed, you have started working on the next instruction, the immediate next one. That was the control hazard. The structure had a contention for the same hardware resources. Data access, instruction fetch, reading the same memory, that's a contention for the same hardware resource. So that's your summary of the three pipeline uh, stage, uh, the three pipelining um, hazard situations. These are ways to deal with hazards. Stalling is sort of the lazy solution, right? It's not a very elegant solution because we are essentially giving up on the benefit that we got by pipelining if you stall. And we stall by using NOPS, use NOPS, no operation. No operation is an instruction. That instruction is all zeros, 32 bit all zeros. That's no, not. Rearrange the code. Move the code around a little bit. The effect should be the same, right? The, 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 the result of that should be the same. You're not able to see it, Yanni? You're able to see, okay. So if you need me to write it, uh, differently, you let me know. So stalling is one, rearranging the code, essentially moving the pieces around, just so that the outcome of the instructions is the same, however, avoiding the hazard situations. Hardware tricks, this is um, register forwarding, like I said, okay, I'm going to implement some uh, pipeline buffers, and I'm going to use that to save the data and not forget about the data. Um, I will need to implement a hazard detection unit, and I can do that to, to fix this problem. So whenever that hazard happens, do this. If it doesn't, then do this. Um, so we'll take a look at more uh, solutions in the next two sessions. So let's take a look at the pipeline data path. So if you are wondering about, okay, where is this all fitting in to the data path, this is where. Now we are gonna quickly recap the steps for all the instructions here. This is, should be a quick recap. You have a instruction fetch, instruction decode, execute, memory access, and memory read completion. So those are all your, uh, different steps involved in the instruction. Here you have a R type instruction, data for that, load, in, load or store instruction, information for that, branch, information for that, jump, information for that. Some of these are for all of them, they are the same. Right? So for example, instruction fetch, what do you do? You take, and it's the same for all types. Whatever you have in the memory, present at address program counter, you load that into the instruction register. Right? So that, that's what you do in the instruction fetch stage. And you also compute PC equals PC plus four, so that the next value is ready to be, uh, to be executed there. For the instruction decode, you read the register file for read register one, read register two, um, and then the, the execution is going to be your or, sorry, hold up, uh, the, the ALU input should be what? PC plus the sign extended 32 bit. That's for your uh, load word, store word, add I, branch, so all those I type instructions, uh, you do that. Next, for ALU, you do the operation, right? That, that's your execution phase. You actually do the, uh, do the uh, addition or subtraction or any logical operation there. For a load store word instruction, you are adding the offset address to the base address. For a branch instruction, 
you're doing a subtraction to figure out if the contents of the two registers are the same or not. For a jump instruction, you are just changing the value of PC to that 32 bit, right? taking that 26 bit address and computing the 28 bit followed by the 32 bit address. In the memory access for R type, over here, you are, you are uh, taking the register, whatever you have in the, this is what, 15 to 11 is uh, RT field. That's your ALU out. For load word, you are reading. For store word, you are writing to memory. Then you have your memory read completion for load or store word. You are left with uh, reading, right? For load, you would still need to read the memory to MDR, right? Whatever you read goes through the M memory data register or memory buffer register. That needs to be put into the register uh, file, one of those registers. So we'll take a look at all of these with the context of the data path block diagram. Now, what are we trying to do here? Earlier, we saw the same diagram all at once. Now we are trying to isolate it into different steps. So for example, the first step is instruction fetch, which is read the instruction memory. Also evaluate PC equals PC plus four for the next one. Maybe we'll do the selection later on. And then th that's your selection. Uh, based on the result over here, that's your selection for the next uh, address to be, in, uh, next instruction to be executed. So all of that is in the instruction fetch stage. Then you have your instruction decode ID or the register file read stage. So in this, you either read the register file or you compute your 32-bit sign extended value for the immediate instruction. Next is your execute stage. ALU, also the addition to compute your um, branch target, uh, branch address or, uh, that's it, right? Branch address, that's it, branch address. Next, memory access. That's just the data memory that you're trying to read or write. Last one is your write back, which is, uh, only a mux over here, but what, what you're doing is you're choosing what to write back to the register file. Is it coming from the memory or is it coming from the ALU output? So we have essentially broken them into instruction fetch, instruction decode, execute, memory, write back. Five stages, go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, it, it, we are going to have to wait for it, right? Because we are trying to do it in a pipeline way, we are going to have to wait for it anyway. Yes. <clears throat> All right, so let's try to see how we can uh, start putting in registers. So what we are doing is, we had five stages, IF, ID, X, MEM, write back. Between these five stages, we have started putting four interstage pipeline buffers. Interstage pipeline buffers or registers. We only need four of them, right? This guy is IFID, instruction, between the instruction fetch and the instruction decode phase step, you have that pipeline buffer. And similarly for IDEX, for EXMEM, for MEM write back. We are putting in instruction, uh, registers in place. Why are we doing this? because we want to uh, save the information about a register throughout the life cycle of the instruction. 
we don't want it to get lost, right? Because once your second instruction comes in and starts working on it, you will have different things being evaluated, right? So you want to preserve whatever you had to support your previous instruction. We are going to use the interstage pipeline buffers to do that preservation. <clears throat> and we'll see that example play out with, uh, with some actual instructions. So what is IFID register going to use? Well, if you look at the, the, the diagram, you know that it is going to hold the instruction uh, register, right? Whatever you read from the instruction memory is going to be held there. And also PC equals PC plus four. So PC plus four value will be held there. So you write to the instruction fetch, the, the IFID uh, register, and then you read from it. So what you're doing is, suppose the instruction is here, right? In the instruction fetch stage. In the instruction fetch stage, you will evaluate instruction register, you will evaluate PC plus four, and you will write it to this register, left half. Writing, left half, reading, right half. And then when you move to the instruction decode phase, you will read from here, work on things, and then you will write to here. And then the next phase, read from here, work on it right here. And you will keep doing that. But what are you reading and writing? That is indicated by the diagram. So for example, in the IDEX pipeline uh, register, you have PC plus four, you, you need that, right? Because later on you will pick from PC plus four and PC plus four uh, plus branch address. So you need that PC plus four later on, as long as the instruction is going on. So you need, you need that. Whatever you have gone through over here, instruction, 32-bit uh, sign extended, you will put that on there as well. Uh, read register, read data one, read data two, you will also put in there, that as well. Not all the lines are being shown here, right? Not all the lines are shown here. Uh, we will put them as we have more discussion on it. So depending on what you see going into these diagrams, you know that those are getting stored and then they are, those are getting used as the instruction moves to the next stage there. La let's take a look at this mem write back. For the mem write back, what are you writing? You are writing uh, ALU result. You're also writing whatever you just read from memory. The outputs are the same things whatever you read from memory and whatever the ALU output is. Control lines are not being shown, right? We don't have control line. Do you think we need to put those as well on top of the interstage pipeline buffers? We absolutely should, right? The moment we know the instruction, we know all the control lines, all of them. Maybe a, we just don't know one of them, uh, branch. We don't know branch because we didn't do the ALU to subtract. Apart from that, we know all the other control signals the moment we know the instruction. And just as the instruction needs to be preserved throughout the life, life cycle of that instruction, all the control lines also needs to be preserved throughout that life cycle. <coughs> so we are going to also need more space on these guys to put those control lines. And as we use them for a particular stage, we can drop them later on. So here we are showing uh, how to indicate things. So this is a load word instruction in the instruction fetch stage. In the instruction fetch stage, what do you do? You read the instruction memory, right half reading the instruction memory, reading the program counter, adding program counter to four, and then you also are waiting for a PC sourced control signal to select one from the other. And in the instruction fetch stage, you write to the left half of that IFID interstage pipeline register. Writing left half, reading right half, right? So, for the load word instruction, you read from instruction memory, 
you evaluate PC plus four, and then you write PC plus four and the instruction onto this instruction fetch, instruction decode register. The same thing keeps happening later as well. As the load word instruction moves to the decode stage, you are reading the things from here, right? You obviously need PC plus four. You obviously need instruction register. So you read from here, and then you also read in register file. So right half is highlighted. You may need to do a 32-bit sign extension that is specific for a, a I-type instruction. Then you also write to the IDEX pipeline state, uh, pipeline buffer. And then it keeps moving on. In the execute stage, read from here, do the ALU operation, write to here. But what are you writing here? You're writing PC plus four plus the uh, branch address, right? So this is your branch address. That's what you're writing here. Branch address. So this is PC plus four plus four times whatever the in words we have written. This is the zero result. This is the ALU result. And this is the read data two. So that's what you will write on the EXMEM pipeline register. In the memory access stage, you will read from here. It's a load word instruction, so you only need to read the memory. So write half. And then whatever you read, you will write to the next pipeline stage. In the write back, you read from here, you pick one or the other, and then you will write to the register file. So left half is shaded. Now the problem is this, where do we write the register? Which register do we write back to? How do we know? So, so far we were able to do whatever we needed to do in order for the instruction to move ahead. But at the very end, if you see, you need the information about where to write word. There you go. So we also need, you see, this instruction has write register, right? We lost that. We lost that information because we didn't, we didn't put it here. We didn't put it here. We lost that information, right? So we, we need that now. So we do this. We also put that, uh, where am I highlighting it here? I'm highlighting it here. I also put that on the next pipeline stage carries over, carries over, and then I can use it at the end. Because all the other things I was able to keep intact as my instruction was moving forward, except for that right register at the end. I, I lost that information. The moment I passed this ID stage, I lost that information. But I needed it at the last stage, which was the register right stage, right back stage. If you want that, you also have to preserve that and sustain that throughout. Keep it with you throughout. So preserve the destination register until the final stage. Questions here, you see the problem? The problem is we did not put the instruction, uh, sorry, we did not put the right register into our IDEX pipeline stage. So we didn't know. which one to write it back to. All right, let's talk about the control. There are going to be a lot of control signals here. Register write, uh, PC source, branch, memwrite, memread, mem memory to register, 
ALU op, register destination, ALU source, all of these are going to uh, be supporting the instruction. So I need to put those things onto the pipeline register. So I will ask you guys this. Let us try to understand what control signals do I need in each stage. So in the instruction fetch stage, are there any control signals that I use there in the instruction fetch stage? OK, let me ask you the question in a different manner. When are the control signals evaluated? After I know the instruction, right? After I know the instruction, I, I will be able to decode that instruction to compute all the control signals. In the instruction fetch stage, I don't even have the instruction. I'm fetching it. So only after I fetch the signal, uh, fetch the instruction, I will be able to figure out what my control lines are. So in the instruction fetch, there's no control signal that is used. You see that? There's no control signal over there. Once you get the register, uh, once you get the instruction, you decode the instruction, then you will know all the control signals. So that's one aspect of it. When are they evaluated for a, for a specific instruction? Next, when are they used? We just now said in the first stage, the instruction fetch stage, no control signal is used. How about in the next one? In the, what is this stage? Instruction decode. In the instruction decode stage, what control signals do you need? Good. You need register right for that. Perfect. So I need to put this. As soon as I get my instruction, I will need to put register right. Uh, no, I need to put all of them onto the pipeline register, uh, onto each of these pipeline registers. However, I will be using register right for the first one, right? Um, but is it really happening? Where is it? Where is it, where is it being really used? Register right? Is it being used? Uh, you see this in the is this in the um, ID stage or is it in the right back stage? Because when you when you write the register, register right is one along with this register. So your register write actually plays a role at the very end, right? When you write it back. So if you know register write, you will have to preserve it the entire way. You have to keep it the entire way because you're gonna need that at the very end in the right back stage. Not true for everything. So for example, ALU source, zero, uh, sorry, not zero. This is a result. ALU source and ALU op. Also, register destination. Register destination, ALU op, ALU source. These three controls, you will use them, right? You write it to the IDEX, use it here, and that's it. You don't need them later on. So you don't need to put it onto the next EX mem state. Put everything on the first one, uh, use as you go through, drop it if you don't need them later on. So in the next one, what do you have? In the EX mem, uh, sorry, in the memory access, you will need memory, mem write. Also branch. In the write back stage, you only have one, mem to register, memory to register. So as soon as we have all the, uh, the instruction, we know all the control lines. At, the, at any time, each stage is working on a different instruction, which means that different control lines will be applicable for 
the different instructions, right? So if there are three instructions in the pipeline, instruction one is there, instruction two is there, instruction three is there, they have their own set of control lines that belong to them. So that's the reason I need to preserve them onto the pipeline registers, just as I did for all the other things, uh, for all the data path related uh, signals earlier. Uh, we need a mechanism to ensure that each stage gets the control lines for the correct instruction. So we try to organize them into categories. So for example, for the instruction fetch and PC increment, we didn't have any uh, control lines. It was just doing things in a straightforward manner. Instruction decode and register fetch state, it was still doing things in the straightforward manner. No control signals were needed for that state. Uh, because remember, register write falls in the register write back stage at the very end when you're writing the register file, not when you read the register file. In the execution stage, if I go back and show you the diagram, in the execution stage, we needed ALU source, ALU op, and register destination. Those three are listed over here. Destination, ALU source, ALU op. In the memory stage, you have branch, memory, mem write, and in the write back stage, you have register write and mem to register. Questions about how we have organized them into those categories? So for each instruction, as soon as you have your instruction, all these control lines are evaluated and you have to keep them with you uh, and the place you are storing them is your interstage pipeline registers. So that's how it looks like, you see, you have your instruction fetch stage, you have uh, fetched the instruction. If you have fetched the instruction, you can use this control unit that, that was your main control unit to evaluate all the control lines. And if you see there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine control lines that are coming out. Some of them used for the write back stage. Some of them used for the memory stage. Some of them used for the execution stage. Let's try to identify them. What could this be? Uh, can I say this? this uh, yeah, right in black. This can be too big. Maybe this can be register write. And then this can be mem to register. Yeah, that's for, for the write back stage, right? I'm essentially writing these over there. I need those for that. Next, for the memory stage, I have branch, memory, mem write. For the execution phase, phase, what do you have? Destination, ALU op, ALU source. Register destination. Yeah? All of those go into the first one. What is that? That's your IDEX pipeline buffer, the pipeline register between the instruction decode and the execution phase. You put all of them on there. Then what do you have here? Here you have your execution, right? Here you have your memory. Then you have your write back. This was decode. In your execution stage, you will use up all of these guys. Once you use up all of these guys over here, you don't need them later on. All you need is write back and memory. 
Then you go into the memory. You use up all of these guys. You don't need them later on. You only need this. And then you, in the last stage, you use the, the, the last two. So you evaluate all the control signals, put them onto the first pipeline register, and as you go through, use them, drop them, use them, drop them, use them, drop them. Questions about how we did this? All the other entries are what? All the other entries are the data path related items. The instruction register, the read register one, read data register two, and so on. Right? All the others from, from here. Right. PC plus four, instruction register, and so on. So all of these is before, and then we are essentially adding on top. Okay. This one shows you all of those things together. This is your data path with control. The data path highlighted in uh, black, the control highlighted in uh, yellow with things written in blue corresponding to the control signals. So let's just identify the stages here. Uh, maybe I make this, yeah, that's fine. Here you have got your instruction fetch stage. Then you have got your instruction decode stage. Execute, memory, and write back. And if you combine the names, you have got these. Instruction fetch, instruction decode, pipeline register. Similarly, IDEX, EXMEM, MEM write back. Those are your pipeline registers. Data path signals, no control there because you don't need control. You, you, you don't have the control signals yet. You evaluate the control signals here, right? After you have that instruction. Once you have them, uh, then you will write all of those guys onto the first pipeline register, use them, drop them. These two will be preserved. Use it in the memory stage, drop it, write back will be preserved use it at the end. All right, questions here, how are we? So this diagram, if it were not for the interstage pipeline registers would be the same as what we saw before the exam. The only thing that we have added over here is the interstage pipeline registers to support not just the data path, but also for the controls. all of this so that the instruction is preserved. All the things that are relevant to the instruction is preser are preserved throughout the life cycle of the instruction. Okay. You've got some time left. Please start working on the activity. Uh, we will try to make some good progress on Thursday on our pipelining conversation, starting to implement the forwarding unit, register forwarding uh, as a detection unit. We'll see what all goes into that. What else? And we'll also talk about the exam stats on Thursday. Was it? Oh, Thursday. Thursday is when I'm asking, so I've asked the grader to try for Thursday. Hopefully we'll get there. Uh, no, not for this class. Yeah, so I'll, I'll see uh, what we need to do, but Most likely, I'll just assign one after you guys come back. Or oh, nothing over break, yes.
I can stop recording here.